Thank you everyone for watching my talk. Uh, today I'm going to be uh, reevaluating two schwa initial reconstructions in uh, proto austronesian and also we're going to be taking a look at pre proto austronesian numerals, and we'll be doing that uh, looking beyond proto austronesian to pre proto austronesian by uh, utilizing a little bit of cro data. And there's a good reason that I'm talking about these two schwa initial reconstructions. Uh, and that comes from some general observations about schwa and its restrictions in proto austronesian and where it, where it does and doesn't appear. So I've talked about this before, um, but schwa has numerous positional restrictions uh, that don't affect the other vowels. So for example, there are no schwa final uh, reconstructions in proto austronesian so schwa is banned from word final position. And if we look at the other end of the word, there's actually only two relatively well-supported schwa initial reconstructions in proto austronesian And those are the numerals asa and anum. Other than those two, you don't find any other words that can be reconstructed to proto austronesian with a schwa in word initial position. So this brings up a question. Uh, is there something going on with these two numeral reconstructions which may help explain why schwa is almost banned from word initial position in proto austronesian but not quite. So we'll be looking at those two reconstructions specifically to see what's going on there and how proto austronesian uh, came to be and perhaps how schwa may have been fully restricted from word initial position in pre proto austronesian. So I approach the issue of schwa initial vocabulary with two strategies. So I'll be using these two strategies today. Um, one, I'll be evaluating the reconstructions themselves and assessing their validity. So perhaps the reason that these schwa initial reconstructions are made is uh, due to error. And we'll take a look at that as a possibility. The other possibility that, that I'll be looking at, um, assuming that the reconstructions are valid, is there any way to figure out what the reconstructions looked like before the time of proto austronesian so pre proto austronesian as I'm referring to it today. And in order to do that, I'll be looking at some numeral data from Cradi uh, and see how it, how it affects our, uh, pro, our pre proto austronesian reconstructions. So utilizing these two strategies, um, this in this presentation, I have the following results. Number one, ASA. The word for one is an invalid reconstruction, so we can go ahead and remove it from proto austronesian uh, Number two, anum, which does appear to be a valid proto austronesian reconstruction, probably started with a fricative, which I'm labeling X in pre proto austronesian And the evidence for that word initial fricative comes from the from crawdite words for six that are cognate. So in the end, uh, we uh, I'm able to remove schwa from word initial position in all pre proto austronesian reconstructions, meaning that before the time of proto austronesian itself, there was a general ban on schwa in word initial and word final position. And any schwa initial vocabulary that exists in Austronesian arose through processes of historical sound change, because originally there were no schwa initial reconstructions. So the outline, I'll be talking about the sources for the reconstructions and the phonology of proto austronesian um, I'll talk a little bit about the use of crawdai and crawdai's position. I'll, and then we'll look at asa one, and then we'll look at anum six. And then after all of that, I'll give the pre proto austronesian numeral reconstruction, which eliminates uh, asa and alters the form of anum. So first of all, for the proto austronesian reconstructions themselves, I'm following the conventions of the Austronesian Comparative Dictionary. So all claims uh, therefore begin with the Austronesian Comparative Dictionary as a starting point. And if you look at the ACD, you find the following uh, proto austronesian reconstructions for the numerals in example one. And you can see that for the word one, there's three competing reconstructions, uh, asa, isa, and asa, and then for uh, the word for six, there is a single reconstruction, and, um, and those are the only two schwa initial reconstructions, not only in the numerals, but in the language in general. 
the evidence for one and six is as follows in two. So for Asa, there's plenty of Malayo-Polynesian evidence, um, but in Taiwan, there's the only evidence that is uh, presented in the ACD comes from Paiwan, Ata, and we'll be looking specifically at that Paiwan uh, lexeme there and evaluating it to see if uh, there may be some issues with it. And then for Anum, it's much more robustly attested in Taiwan. So if there's just a few of the many attestations of Anum 6, uh, and then again with a couple of Malayo Polynesian attestations there. So as I've already mentioned, there's no other Swan initial reconstructions um, and not all, of, all, not all of the evidence is given in two, but enough to get an idea. Uh, and Asa is evidenced by only Pi 1 in Taiwan. So regarding the vowels themselves, there are uh, the fact that there's only two schwa initial numerals is surprising um, because schwa is otherwise heavily restricted in Proto-Austronesian. Uh, there are four commonly reconstructed vowels, AI, NU, and schwa itself. And there are several restrictions on schwa that have been noted. I'll just read through these quickly. Schwa did not appear in word final position. It did not appear in prefixing or infixing morphology. It's been claimed that schwa cannot be immediately followed by a glide, although there are some reconstructions that seem to run counter to that claim. No other vowels have these any sorts of similar restraints, and they're free to appear in any position. And the restrictions on schwa that we see here began to break down as proto austronesian developed. So there are numerous languages that are spoken today that have schwa in initial position, in final position, in infixing and prefixing morphology. But when it comes to proto austronesian as a reconstructed language, none of that existed. So three, the, using Krati in Austronesian, so since I'll be looking at pre-Proto-Austronesian in this uh, presentation, one might ask, how do we look beyond Proto-Austronesian? Since Austronesian evidence can only really be used to make inferences about Proto-Austronesian itself, in order to look beyond Proto-Austronesian to a pre-Proto-Austronesian level, we have to have some sort of outside evidence. And in this presentation, that evidence is coming from Krati. And one may wonder if the use of Krati evidence depends on the validity of the Austro-Thai hypothesis, the Austro-Thai hypothesis being the hypothesis that Krati and Austronesian are related. Um, although that hypothesis is certainly very interesting for this presentation, it's not necessary that Krati and Austronesian be related in order to use Krati to make inferences on pre-Proto-Austronesian. And that is because even if the Austronesian numerals in Krati are borrowed, for example, the borrowings may retain information on older forms that have been lost in the donor language, the donor language being whatever language ultimately gave way to Proto-Austronesian. So even if the Krati evidence is just borrowings, that borrowing could still be old enough to tell us something about pre-Proto-Austronesian that we wouldn't be able to see by looking at Austronesian alone. So this presentation, even though I'll be using Krati evidence, is principally concerned with Austronesian. Uh, and what I'm saying here and the use of Krati evidence and is uh, strictly about Austronesian lexical history from an Austronesian perspective. So let's move on to the analysis itself. We have uh, the numeral one, Asa. Uh, it has three competing reconstructions in the ACD, Asa, Asa, and Isa. And in four, I list some of the Formosan evidence for that reconstruction. So you can see that Isa is very robustly attested. Um, Asa is attested, but less so. And Asa is evidenced from Taiwan only with Paiwan Ata. So we have Isa and Asa, and then Asa with only a single Formosan witness. In Malayo-Polynesian, all three forms are robustly attested. So the issues with these don't exist in Malayo-Polynesian. They only exist in foremost in, um, the, at the Proto-Austronesian level. So in evaluating ASA, we need to look at the source for the Paiwan entry in the Austronesian Comparative Dictionary. Uh, Blust sourced the Paiwan word from Farrell's 1982 Dictionary of Paiwan. And this source has a few issues. Um, most of those have to deal with the presence of hypothetical roots uh, 
in the dictionary. And if you look at uh, page nine of the dictionary, you see uh, an extended discussion about his use of these hypothetical roots. So here's just a short quote, certain putative roots are attested only in frozen complex forms. And those are analyzed based off of the author's analysis, not from any sort of uh, attestation as independent roots in the language. So for example, Helis Kathai is a root word with a cross-reference to uh, Parakatlai priest. And this is done despite a lack of evidence that Katlai is an actual root. Uh, there are other examples in the dictionary, for example, Valanga, mortar, which is listed under three separate entries, one with Langa as if the form were derived from a root Langa with a prefix Va. There's another entry in the dictionary, Vanga, as if the form were derived from a root Vanga with an infix. And then there's a third entry, Valanga, as a frozen complex form or as a possible trisyllabic root. And these are just two examples of many of the uh, hypothetical roots that are listed in the dictionary. This is a technique that Farrell uses uh, quite often in the dictionary. And he also goes on to state down here at the bottom, scholars of comparative Austronesian linguistics will recognize that such cross-listing is not meant to imply each of these multiple entries represents a viable productive root in Paiwan. So if we approach the dictionary uh, understanding that it's full of hypothetical roots that don't necessarily uh, represent viable roots in Paiwan, we can start to analyze the entry ata and come to the conclusion that ata is also a hypothetical root, not an actual root. So on pages 41 to 43 in the dictionary, Farrell lists all the numeral data, listing ita, but not ata. On page 90, there's the entry for ata itself, and all that is is a cross-reference to the root ta um, with one in parentheses. And it's important to note that this is the format that Farrell uses when he enters hypothetical roots. So you just have a ta as an entry with a cross-reference to the actual root ta. And you find something similar for ita. And then in the reverse dictionary on page 446, you find uh, that ita and ta are listed as roots, but not a ta. And all of this uh, gives us reason to suspect that a ta is not an actual root in Paiwan, but just a hypothetical root in the dictionary, and so does not uh, represent valid evidence for a proto austronesian reconstruction. And if we look at more recent sources on Paiwan, uh, Chen and Chang, uh, both 2006, it's reported that schwa is not a permissible word initial vowel in Paiwan, which really uh, hammers home the fact that ata is probably just a hypothetical root. And so if we remove ata, we remove the only piece of Formosan evidence. And since all proto austronesian reconstructions require Formosan evidence, um, asa is no longer valid as a proto austronesian reconstruction. And so we can make our, our first slight revision of the proto austronesian numerals with isa and asa as the only attested numerals asa now removed. And that leaves anum as the only schwa initial lexeme reconstructed to Proto-Austronesian. So with that, we can move on to talking about uh, anum. Uh, actually, here's a little bit real quickly. I got ahead of myself there. Uh, about the reflexes of one in Kradai. In Kradai, there's evidence for Isa, but not Asa. And that comes from the fact that the uh, reflexes in uh, Kra here, Glaukubian Kaviad, these bottom three, um, they have evidence of an I in the penultimate position. Uh, and that high vowel left traces on the palatalization of the initial in the reflexes. And this is something that was noted in Osta, by Osta Pirat in 2018, that disyllabic reconstructions leave uh, evidence for the disyllable or for the penultimate syllable uh, via labelization or velarization of the of the monosyllabic initial or palatalization of the monosyllabic initial. And so you see that here with the craw reflexes. So according to Kradai evidence for pre-Proto-Austronesian, we have evidence for Isa, but not Asa. But at the Proto-Austronesian level, there's foremost evidence for Asa. Okay, now we can move on to six. Uh, anum is better supported than Asa, which we now know has no support whatsoever. Uh, and here I list the Formosan evidence for Anum. It's quite robustly attested. Um, 
The analysis of Anum does not end here, however. So we're not just saying that Anum was a proto austronesian reconstruction. If we look at the Krati evidence for Anum, it suggests that in the pre proto austronesian level, there was an initial consonant. And that evidence also comes from Kra. So the Austronesian numerals in Krati are limited because of borrowing, but we have uh, reconstructable numerals to proto fly and also proto Kra. Uh, that all that mostly appear to be cognate with uh, proto austronesian numerals. And here are the cognates with six uh, in uh, example eight. So for our purposes, only the CRA evidence is relevant since Hly does not have any indication of whether or not there was an initial consonant. Uh, but you can see there for the proto CRA reconstruction in eight, the Osta Pirat reconstructs an X in word initial position. And that's what we're interested in. What is that X and what is the evidence for it? Is the evidence good enough to reconstruct that X? Um, and how might that influence our understanding of pre proto austronesian So we'll look at that and uh, we'll do that by looking at the tonal reflexes in craw uh, words for six and in the voicing of the initial nasal. So tone in Krati is typically split into four classes, A, B, C, and D. I won't go into too much detail about that, um, but A, which is what the tone class that six belongs to, is usually associated with um, vowel final or nasal final roots. And since anum ends in the nasal, it is predictably an A class tone. In many languages, there are also further tone splits that are driven um, by familiar processes like the loss of voicing and onsets. And so this is true in cross. So A, B, C, and D tones are split into A1 and A2, B1 and B2, and so on. Sapira so refers to this as the one, two voicing series. Series one tones are triggered uh, by voiceless onsets, possibly also other things, um, but at least in part by voiceless onsets. And series two tones are uh, associated with voiced onsets. So with uh, a num specifically, since the medial consonant in the reconstruction, a num is a voiced nasal, uh, we expect it to have series two tones because it was voiced. So if we look at some, some different uh, tone splits in craw, uh, proto craw had voiceless nasals, voiced nasals, and it also had nasals that were in medial position as part of a sesquisyllable. So in the first set here, uh, voiceless nasals and also voiceless sonorants in general, so there, there's a voiceless L there. Uh, those uh, voiceless initials are course, correspond to series one tones uh, regularly in these examples here, and that's what we expect. Um, in the second section, there are two um, voiced nasal reconstructions and those are predictably associated with uh, series uh, two tones because it has a voiced initial. Um, and this is all things else being equal where we would expect a num to land because a num has a voiced nasal in uh, initial position num. Uh, but that's not actually the case. So when we look at reflexes of a num, uh, it has a mixture of series one tones and series two tones. So the series one tones are unhighlighted and the series two tones are highlighted. Uh, and then also uh, reflexes of six are voiced in some languages and voiceless in other languages. And there's a general mismatch between the voicing of the initial and the series uh, tone that it corresponds to. For, so for example, in Galao, the word for six has a voiced initial but it is associated with a, a voiceless split, a tone split. A paha has a voiced initial and a series two tone, which is what we expect. Bubyao here has a voiceless initial but a, and a uh, voiceless tone, which is also once again what we expect. But then in Buyang, you have a, a voiced initial but a voiceless tone split, which is uh, unexpected. And so to explain this tone split, what Osapiro proposes is that there was a uh, initial here, in this case, X, that X existed in proto -craw, And then after the breakup of proto -craw, it uh, influenced the voicing of the initial in different ways in different languages, resulting in this pattern that we see here. 
Uh, but how do we know that it, that it was an X? Is there any good evidence that it was an X and not some other thing? There is some good evidence that it was an X. So for example, um, protocrawl words with a voiceless initial, be it X or some other unknown initial, correspond to prototype voiceless uh, nasal initials. If it was a voiceless, if it was a voiceless velar in protocrawl, it also corresponds to velarization in Lakya and Southern Com. So you can see here that the uh, the nasal here is an M, but it's reflected with K in Lakya and Engma in Southern Com, due to the influence, the velarization influence of the X. That same velarizing influence is not found uh, in words that have a a different uh, voiceless. Uh, initial consonant in protocrop. So for example, the word for bear uh, does not undergo uh, velarization in Southern Com, neither does the word thick. So this gives us some, some evidence that the X reconstruction is correct, uh, at least in the fact that it was probably a velar. So since we know the X is probably accurate, we can then uh, propose that at the pre-proto-Austronesian level, um, that X was present in the word for six, so we can reconstruct pre proto austronesian Hunam rather than Unum. Uh, did Hunam persist in the proto austronesian uh, There is no Austronesian evidence that X remained as an initial in proto austronesian There's a little bit of ambiguity regarding uh, the status of uh, initial fricatives, especially H, S, and now X in proto austronesian there is evidence for H initial reconstructions, and that evidence is given here in 11. Um, but also, there is a tendency across the family for H and S initial reconstructions to delete or not delete irregularly. Uh, and here I have examples from proto austronesian to proto maleo polynesian but the irregularity in retention of H initial uh, of of word initial H's is also found in, in Taiwan. So you see here that uh, S and H merge with H and in many Malayo-Polynesian words, the H deletes, but also in some Malayo-Polynesian words, the H is retained. So there's a certain level of ambiguity as to whether um, X or possibly an H from an earlier X was present and just lost in Austronesian languages or if it was lost before Proto-Austronesian. Um, but nevertheless, even though that ambiguity exists, the fact that there's no evidence that we can look at means that we can't reconstruct Hunam to Proto-Austronesian. It's also very interesting to note that Blust in 2018 reconstructed an X in word final position in some Proto-Austronesian words, noting that X and H have a tendency to change irregularly. Um, it is tempting to suggest that the X in word initial position in Hunam uh, is the same phoneme as the X that blessed reconstructs toward final position in some Austronesian words. Um, but we're not able right now to make that determination about Proto-Austronesian since uh, the X is not retained in any known Austronesian language and there's no uh, sign that it was ever there. The only sign that it was there comes from outside of Austronesian which means that we can reconstruct the X to pre-Proto-Austronesian, but we're restricted with what we can do for Proto-Austronesian itself. So to conclude, I've demonstrated that schwa initial words in Austronesian were not inherited, but rather emerged due to sound change. Um, I specifically made these following observations. A saw is an invalid reconstruction, so we can remove it from Proto-Austronesian reconstructions. A num descends from a pre proto austronesian word chanum, which had an X in word initial position. And so with those two points, we can now state that schwa did not appear at any word boundary, uh, word initial or word final in pre proto austronesian And over time, that restriction was weakened as the language developed. And finally, in 13 here, I have the pre proto austronesian reconstructions that I'm proposing. Um, Esa for one, because that's the only word with uh, evidence outside of uh, Austronesian, and Hunam for six, because of the craw evidence that there was an X in word initial position. And that's my presentation. Thank you very much. And I have a few references here. So, yeah, thank you very much for my presentation. And I look forward to hearing uh, everybody's thoughts. Thanks.